Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, everybody. Must be Tuesday again. I have something fantastic for you. Not that every week's not pretty good, but this week, extra special. So I really appreciate you uh, giving us a little of your time. With me is Nancy Ann Hobart, and she is a nurse and a comedian. And she is going to talk about improv for health and or also how we can use improv for Alzheimer's caregiving. So thanks for joining me, Nancy. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I just love living in the moment. And that's what it's all about. (laughs) I have learned to do that a lot better as I've gotten older, but it was not easy with my mom. And I don't know if it was because of the, you know, parent child relationship that, you know, even in my fifties seemed to dominate our feelings, (laughs) even though she thought I was her best friend. It was, it was hard. It was very hard to just let go and be in her world because you know I had other things I had to worry about and think about and get done so it is hard because I'm a nurse and I plan but then I always say my saying is don't worry in advance because I have friends that say oh I can't make plans with you on Tuesday because it might rain well it might not rain so (laughs) I just say don't worry in advance you know if it doesn't work on Tuesday we could do it on Wednesday and I know with older people my mom was ill for a while in Pennsylvania I flew back a lot during COVID Mm. you don't want to know how many airplanes I was on (laughs) And I went back a lot. They, it was fine. I was fine, but it's true. It's like, you think this is going to happen. You could plan it, but you know, be open to new happenings, new experiences. That's my saying. Yeah. Yeah. I needed to learn to be open to new things because as you're probably aware, you know, my mom was in late stage Alzheimer's. So getting her into the car, over Mm -hmm. to the park, out of the car, And she was very good at watching her feet while she walked. And she would literally walk 10 to 15 feet behind me. Uh I could do nothing to fix that problem. And it terrified me that she was going to like trip over something and land on her face. And I was going to be the, you know what, because I wouldn't let her catch up or, you know, and it's like, I could not get her to walk arm in arm. If I slowed down, she slowed down. If I stopped, she stopped. It was just like, but she wouldn't hold your arm like that nope. for support. Oh, I'm sorry. I hated it. So uh, I had a guest, um, Tammy, and I cannot remember her last name at the moment. She's been on twice. She, we were talking before we recorded, and she said, "Wait, you said your mom was the oldest of four? And I said, "Yeah." She she was baking. She was keeping an eye on the children. You were one of the children. It's just kind of like her natural state. And I was like, "Dang, I wish I'd known that." Then. That was it. Then I could have turned around and play acted like, you know, and talked to her and it would have made sense. Uh But I was just trying to get her to walk next to me. And I know they don't have peripheral vision, all the things, but oh my gosh, it was just like the biggest. My mom was also the oldest and I'm an oldest. So when I would go back, I think I was the only one that would give her jobs and they were little jobs. I said, mom, there's a load of wash. I'm going to wheel your wheelchair over by the chair and you can fold it. She was like, oh, I like to do this because everybody else folds it the wrong way. I'm like, well, you fold it the right way. So I, my sister goes, how do you get her to do jobs? I said, I just said, this needs to be done. That needs to be done. You can't stand at the kitchen sink. I could do that, but you could fold the wash. So it's just like, I think it's important to give them little jobs. You know, even if you don't call it a job, say we're going to have fun with the wash now, you know, and who cares how they fold it? So yeah, I'm a job giver. (laughs) I'm an oldest. You want a job? Come to my house. (laughs) I'm the oldest also, but my sister was never compliant. So (laughs) (laughs) it was just easier to do things myself than fight with her. Well, I'm not picky. My my attitude is anybody that's going to help. Thanks. (laughs) I'm not picky. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm okay with that. I mean. I have to, I have to release getting it done my way, which I'm not too bad with, but um, I could never, my mom always stressed about getting it right. That's how my mom was. Oh, so I, can I help? And it'd be like, sure. And then she's like, am I doing it right? Am I doing it? And and then she'd stop. Am I doing it right? Uh, You're not doing it at all. Yeah. My mom had a certain way of folding and I'm like, I don't care how it's folded, just get it done. So that's why I let her do it. But yeah, going back to, I have these nifty little cards that I give out when I do talks and it says your daily reminders. 
And one of them says, use yes and every day because yes and will open doors and no butt shuts the doors. And <laughs> when I'm on stage, I hit my butt. I go, no butt shuts the doors. Yes and opens it. But yes and you could take them around the back door. Like, yes and I heard you're hungry. Eat your healthy food first and then we'll have dessert. I used it on my kids. I mean, I have two good kids. I'm the crazy mom. Yes, Sam, we'll go to the park after you do your homework. And, you know, I say as women, we're asked to be on so many committees and you don't want to say no, no, no. So you go, yes, Anne, thank you, Miss Jennifer, for asking me. But right now I'm a little overcommitted. Ask me in about three or four months. I'm really saying no, but, you know, maybe in a couple months I could do it. But when people start hearing yes and, so I say yes and's a muscle and we have to use it a lot. Use it for the people in the store. Use it when the doctor says, no, we can't do this. The real estate person, yes and. I don't like this house. However, I bet the next house I might like. So, and then the other thing I, we were talking about this, embrace the unexpected. You don't know what's going to happen, but it could be fun. You know, learn to see the humor in all situations. I was doing a talk at a senior center and this lady goes, oh, does that mean like when I fell down and everybody saw my Tuesday panties and it was really Wednesday? I go, yeah, that could be the humor. I said, I didn't know they made those anymore. <laughs> Especially for an adult. <laughs> I know. She goes, oh, I have a lot of. I was wearing them on the wrong day. And then listen actively. Sometimes people will tell you it's really bothering them, but you have to learn to listen between the lines. You know, they won't say it right out. They'll say it this way, that way. And you're like, okay. And then my last one is take risk. Mistakes and failures are all okay. Because that's where we learn to grow and meet fun people and go on adventures on planes. You know, so <laughs> risk and failures are okay. So it's like, these are your daily reminders. When I go and I do my talks, I hand them out and they go, these are good. The young kids go, I just take a photo and it's on my phone. I'm like, well, <laughs> whatever works for you. <laughs> this is true. So let's take a step back. How did you become a nurse and a comedian? They seem to be a, a little bit mutually exclusive, <laughs> like the... Uh, neurophysicist slash biblical scholar I talked to a year or so ago. I I, 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 I kind of wondered if he argued with himself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I probably would have gone right into the arts because I've always done acting, but I grew up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and I lived next to a hospital. So at age five, I said, I'll be a nurse. And when my friends all went to college and kept switching their majors, I was like, no, I'm going to be a nurse. But the minute I was done being a nurse and started working, I started doing little theater. Then I moved to Marstown, New Jersey and New York City. And there I was working part time for an oncologist. And I was also doing off off Broadway. I worked at Radio City Music Hall. So if I found out that if I couldn't get jobs in one, the other one always wanted me. Then I came out to L.A. and I started doing nursing and acting. And I was working at UCLA on the cardiac floor. And that's when I realized the connection between the brain and the heart and all the emotions. And I was also doing nursing and acting. And I worked as an actor on Days of Our Lives. And then they, oh, wow. said, they said to me, would you be our baby nurse? I'm like, yeah, what's a baby nurse? Well, the law does protect these kids that work in the industry. And they have to have a real nurse on the set. So I'm an advocate for the baby. So these crazy moms that get their kids in acting, I'm there to watch their kids and make sure that nothing's dangerous. I could bark out orders like that cord is dangerous. <laughs> I have to carry the baby over that. And would you move that? And so, you know, it's it's fine. So I still do nursing and acting. I still keep up my nursing license. Um, I don't work at hospitals anymore. But I, I think it's really, it's also, they're finding that people who do improvisation in the medical field can think fast on their feet. And, you know, and, you know, think of emergency people and doctors, how you're always pivoting. Um, my my kid who's now 30, thank God, he was hit, he was hit by an SUV when he was 10. Ooh. And I went to the site and his bike was here, his helmet was there, his shoes were there. And I looked at my neighbor and I said, Judy, I'm going to the hospital. I need your sweater. She's like, here, take it. And I know hospitals are cold. She goes, how'd you think of that? He said, I just knew I was going along in that ambulance. And then three days later, I gave her her sweater back. But it's like, I think the idea in medicine, you have to be able to pivot. And I saw that, you know, also in acting. And then I did a lot of reading and research. And in our brain, we have telomeres. And those are the 
protective end caps. They're equal to at the end of your shoelace, you have aglets, those plastic things. And people think as you age, you have to, the aglets, the telomeres will fray, but not necessarily. We can do seven things to bring them back together. And the seven things I'm going to say are exercise. We know that. <laughs> Proper sleep. This is hard because people don't like to sleep. And we should get at least six, maybe seven or eight hours. But guess when the best sleep for your brain is? Between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. Now, that doesn't mm. mean you slide in the covers at 145 and go, ooh, I made it. <laughs> so I'm a comic. Sometimes I'm out late. But if I'm home, I do try to wind down at 930, 10 o'clock. Because 10 to 2 is your best sleep. And, you know, inflammation, brain exercises, socialization. You know, I have a lot of friends that we go walking, playing games, nutrition, and get your medical conditions under control and control your stress. That will help you live to 105 and beyond. That's our plan. <laughs> yep. Yeah, as, like, as, like, as my listeners know, my paternal grandmother lived to 103. So that's my goal. So, like three-ish months shy of 47 years, which sometimes I think, geez, that's a long time. I've already been around quite a bit. Good. I'm around another 47 years. I don't know what I'll do with myself, but I'm sure I'll find some things because, you know, I like, I I swear I should be a Gemini. I'm a Scorpio, but it's like, well, I like my, Gemini. Yeah. Um, yeah. My sister, and my dad, Gemini's, there's a reason we call them sign of schizophrenia. I'm <clears throat> sorry. Um, <laughs> Sign of the twins. Anywho, um, <laughs> not the easiest people to live with sometimes. Well, he says that about me. I'm an Aries, so. <laughs> okay. Eh, Scorpios can be a little passionate, which means fiery. Which, you know, we can we can get a little passionate sometimes with how we feel about things. Yeah. So all of us are challenging to live with sometimes. Um, but I think I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. Um, I I like I like my home base. But I like to do new and different things and then Good. come back and like regroup. Mm -hmm. So I was in D.C. in March, Washington, D.C., flew out yeah. by myself, um, basically had three days, two and a half days before I was doing my congressional stuff with the Alzheimer's Association. And I was like, I haven't been to D.C. before making the most of this trip. And so I just went everywhere and anywhere I could manage, including so we were talking about pivoting. Mm -hmm. the day I flew home, I was like, the one thing I haven't done yet is seen the inside of the Capitol building. So I went and I, I managed to get on a tour. I'm sneaking into the front of the line. <laughs> That's with, the way to do it. <laughs> I, you know, it was kind of a loose uh, ah. interpretation of a line. Um, so that was fine. I, it's not like I prevented other people from coming in. So mm -hmm. I wasn't too horrible. Um, basically then had to take the train and walk a mile to the hotel, walk a mile back to the train, get on the train and go to the airport, got to the airport. So I was in boarding group number one. When I got to the airport, it was boarding group number four. And I was like, perfect. Amazing. Didn't have to wait. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But That's I was watching my watch and I was like, this is the only flight out of this airport to California. So You're I'm going to make it. <laughs> I'm not going to miss this flight because I do not want to sleep in the airport. <laughs> no, no, but that's what it is, you know, being open to new situations. And then at the end, when it's over, you know, sure, it's a little tense, but I just got back from Rome. I went with five gals to Rome. I've never been wow. there. And I have a friend who is a media Catholic nun. She reviews films. She does documentaries. And she said, come over. And then they interviewed me on Vatican Radio. So I don't oh, know wow. going to air. <laughs> so it was a trip of a lifetime. We just ran around like crazy every day. We did five, six miles climbing those steps. Some days I was like, oh, I don't know if I could do this. And my friends are like, yeah, you could. It was five gals. And we were only there for five or six days. So I would go back. It just kind of came up fast. And we said, OK, we'll come. And I picked March because she's our friend said once April and May comes, it gets more crowded, more expensive, hot. And March was beautiful. I mean, it called for rain. But guess what? Unlike California, <laughs> no rain. <laughs> yeah, we didn't. Let's see. I think we had just a little bit of fat drizzle. I mean, it was more annoying than actually wet on Friday the 18th. But D.C. can get cold if the drizzle is cold drizzle. Yeah. Yeah. Now we had one really cold, bitterly cold day that it was cold. And then the wind came through and it was like, uh, ugh. I'm like, yeah. not sure the uh, 500 foot depth of snow and the constant rain is 
I think that might be better today. So I was the only... somewhere between the 40s and the 60s. And I took a ski jacket. One day I had to take it off. One day I put the hood up. I I think it's rainy. My friend goes, no, that's drizzle. But <laughs> I mean, we really had beautiful weather the whole time we were there. So it was a trip of a lifetime. And I have to blink and go, is I really there? And then I look at my phone. Yep, you were there. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like I'm back again doing my same stuff. So, but I'm, you know, I also, we we moved at the end of 21 all of 2022, my husband had a, a foot injury that oh. resulted in a, a large toe being amputated. That I'm was sorry. not fun. Um, so basically all of 2022, all the things we had planned on doing didn't happen. Yeah. Finally in September, I'm like, that's it. The club that I wanted to start in our community. I just needed to like pull the trigger. I did that, Good. you know. Um, so yeah. we're getting out there. We're, we're meeting more people, doing more things. So yeah, I'm going to Arizona next month with AATH. It stands for um, Association for Applied Therapeutic Humor People. So a lot of them are psychologists, psychiatrists, and they bring humor into the hospitals, into nursing homes. And so it's Arizona. I'm going to drive. It's only five, six hours away. So I'm looking forward to that trip in April. Well, it'll be hot. Well, I like hot. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I've been to spring training twice. The first year it was like, holy crap. It was 90 degrees in March. Wow. And my body was like, what the heck? And okay. then the next year, it wasn't quite that hot. I think the first year was like 90, 95. Oh. And the next year was like 80, 85. Was perfect. Okay, so was not the winter clothes I took to Rome. I'll bring no. my sleeveless stuff. Oh, goody. Oh, goody. Yeah, no. I, yeah, Arizona gets quite hot. So, oh, I mean, yeah. they get some chilly times, but. You were talking about, so, you know, this convention you're going to with basically funny medical people, because I can't remember. Yes, the acronym. It is. It's funny medical people. That's so yeah. they, they do say laughter is the best medicine. You really do feel good after a nice big laugh. So, it's so important to get out of your brain and just laugh. And um, I'm going to tell you something else that I like to share, how emotions harm your body. And we all know people that hi hang on to anger. Anger will weaken your liver. Grief weakens your lungs. Worry weakens your stomach. How many people have stomach issues? <laughs> Stress weakens your heart and your brain. Fear weakens your kidney. But love will bring you peace and harmony. It strengthens your body and your mind. And laughter reduces stress. And smile spreads happiness. So sometimes when we're stressed out, you have to find the humor which I think that was in one of my cards even. Yeah, find the humor in all situations. So I was at the airport and this is going back because I traveled a lot during COVID. They wouldn't give this guy a mask. And I saw the mask on the other side. And they said, sir, you have to bring your own mask. And I put my foot on the counter like I was going to climb over. I don't think I could have made it. And I go, I'll just give him one. And, the, and this big guy goes, honey, you don't have to do that for me. And then she just threw him a mask. And I was like, come on, let's share the mask. Let's make yeah. it here. It was let's like, share the masks and not the COVID. Thank you. That's what I, it was like they were right over there. So I put my foot up on the counter. There was no way I was going to climb over. But he laughed and the, and the flight attendant goes, here, he can have one. I go, well, I see him right there. So I'm one of those people that if I see a problem, I'm going to speak up. I'm going to try and solve it. That's so yeah. I have not worked corporate America since 19, early 91, like oh April. And there's a big reason for that. Mm. It's because I will find the solution to a situation, a problem, whatever. Yes. And then it's like, I have analyzed what needs to be done or what the problem is or whatever. And this is the best way to move forward. I don't care what you think. <laughs> It's like, because this will make it simple for everybody. I agree. I agree. See? My, hus my husband says I'm a rebel because when he found out, so I did not tell him, I did not text him that I was, you know, taking the, I did not tell him, okay, I'm on the train going back to the hotel to get my suitcase to go back to the train. And then I got to switch train, you know, Metro trains to get to the one to the airport. I just let him know when I was on the appropriate train headed to the airport. I did not tell him until we got, I got back to California that I had been playing, you know, All Russian those steps roulette with. Involved, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I was watching the time. I was getting a little bit nervous, mostly because the train that I needed to Dallas was a little delayed for my mm -hmm. comfort. But I got on the plane, no big deal. And I was in, I'd upgraded to first class so I could sleep on the way oh, out. Oh, good for you. Yeah. And you know, so I was like the very first seat. So I'm like, 
like as long as I get on the airplane, I'm not even going to disturb anybody. (laughs) I'm going to talk about when you say being a rebel, sometimes it comes across as a rebel, but sometimes it's also good. When I travel, I go into the restrooms and I make a big deal when they're cleaning the toilets because that's a hard job. And I clap and I go, wow, these are shiny. I had a woman cry on my shoulders and go, I've been doing this for 40 years. Nobody thanks me. And I said, well, I drink water, coffee, tea, and I really appreciate you. She goes, oh my gosh. It's like, so, and then I said this to one of my friends. I said, why don't you do that when you travel? She goes, well, what would she think of me? I go, first of all, she probably wouldn't see you again. And second of all, who cares what she thinks? You know, so I just, I just come from, just get it out. You know, there's a saying, like, if you miss somebody, call them. If you haven't heard from a friend, reach out to them. Don't overthink things. So when I was starting my business, I remember telling my dad, he goes, sounds like a lot of common sense to me. I grew up with a dad who owned his own hardware store in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I was the one that left. So I don't know the difference between a three-fourths inch and a one-fourth nut and bolt. So don't ask me that. (laughs) I bring my husband a hammer. He goes, no, I asked for a screwdriver. I go, well, here's all the tools. But what I'm saying is he was very big on common sense. And that's sort of where... I think the basis of my business comes from common sense is not so common. You know, if you want to say something and don't hold on to hurt because that's how the anger and, you know, all the grief and all the worry builds up in our bodies. So, you know, the good Lord gave us two shoulders. Let it go like the Disney song. Yeah. Don't, go, don't go grab it back. You know, I li- I use little things in my talks like I'm on a train and this beautiful Jennifer steps on my toe with her high heels. But I don't say ouch. So she doesn't even know. Then I go over to this gal. And I say, Jennifer's mean. She stepped on my toe. And then I remember this for months. All I had to do was say, ouch, you'd say sorry. And we're friends. So it's kind of like if somebody hurts your feelings, whether it's physical or what they said, just say, ouch. Oh, I didn't mean it this way. I meant it that way. We all come from different backgrounds. And, you know, people on the East Coast just blow and say it like it is. And some people hold it in and be polite. So it's just like, don't overthink things. That's what I'm finding out. You know, it's. I've learned through the years to stop overthinking things and, you know, stressing about what if. Yes. Yeah. Don't do what ifs. No, no. Yeah. It's like, Oh no, the sponsor just emailed me. Oh God, what is it going to say? Oh, they just want to know if we're, if I'm okay with the new ad for April. Oh yeah. Duh. That was done weeks ago. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I have a friend that, well, my friend's mom just turned 91 and she's lives from this grateful Point of view every time she goes, I'm so grateful you came to visit me today. I'm so grateful you brought me candy. And I go, Well, it's only a half a candy because I ate the other half. And she goes, That's okay. I don't need the other half. And you know, so it's like just be in the moment, be grateful, and hopefully we'll all make it to a hundred and beyond. <laughs> and well, I I learned a long time ago, probably geez, almost 20 years, to to find the gratitude and the things to appreciate every yes. day. Because I have a tendency to run negative. Like mm. I'm like, I hate this thing, but I, you know, I'm not a glass half empty kind of person. Cause it just kind of de- depends on if you're thirsty or not. I hate that phrase, but that's how a lot of people used to see me. It's like, Oh geez, she's complaining again. No, I'm not just making a statement. So I had to unlearn. I had to learn not to like, I hear I'm making a statement and they're hearing I'm complaining. So how do I adjust? And so I've learned that. And then I've also learned that, like, you know what? This is who I am. Like it or go away. And throw a little humor in there and they'll see that you're serious. But, you know, okay, I'm still joking about it. And it's true what you said. Yeah. So I've just recently learned to also find something every day to be proud of yourself. Yes. I'm like, that's actually really smart because, and I know this doesn't really have a lot to do with improv, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. still important. Um. You know, we, we all, it's really easy to say, oh, you know, gosh, I was kind of slacking today. I didn't get my to-do list done and, oh, I didn't eat as good. I, I had an early recording, so I didn't exercise. Like there's always negative stuff you can find, but it's like, you know what? I'm proud of my, me for X, whatever. Yes. You know, it doesn't even have to be a big thing for acknowledging that I was kind of slacking today. That, that works. So you tie that in with gratitude and humor. Oh, you're going to have a great, great positive outlook and probably really healthy heart and brain. It does help. Gratitude is so important. I have a saying that curiosity is generosity and generosity is curiosity. So when I travel and I'm curious about these people, they feel like I'm being generous with my time, which I probably am, but then I'm learning something from them. I mean, what took this woman 
40 years to show up and clean toilets in the airport, you know, and I always want to learn about them and talk to them. And, you know, so it's sort of, it goes both ways. Yeah. Like you said, it's, it's true. But um, so do you know the difference? A lot of people do, and some don't between comedy and improv, because I do stand up also. Well, comedy is more scripted, right? Comedy is passive. It's scripted. I tell a joke, you sit there, you laugh. Improv is interactive. When I do my improv sessions, I call on people, whether it's on Zoom, whether it's in person. You know, I go around the room, Jennifer, quick, tell me an action word that begins with J, because that's your first name. And then I see all the people thinking, oh, I got to think of a, an action word, my first name. I go, sorry, I just changed it to last name. <laughs> you can't prepare. <laughs> so, and, you know, this is sort of has kept me kept the brain young and going. And I use little analogies. Like I did go to Macy's recently and there was a problem I built. And I think the girl's name was Jennifer and she was a young whippersnapper <laughs> and it said customer service. And she's like looking at her phone, go, sorry, I can't help you. And I just stood there and I said, Jennifer, I'm going to go to the bathroom because I drink a lot of water, coffee, tea, and you're going to figure this out. Maybe you have to ask your supervisor, but I bet you, you might be a supervisor next week. And she goes, hardly, I hate this job. So I allowed 20 minutes because I knew it was going to take her a while. I came back and she goes, oh, we fixed your bill. I'm supposed to give you this. It's a $20 gift card. Way to go, Jennifer, you're moving on up. And again, <laughs> I was thinking, what if I was like 80? And she'd say, sorry, I can't help you. I would just go away and go, okay. So I kind of make people work a little. <laughs> it's like, you know, pull them out of their comfort zone and, you know, okay, this is what's going to happen. This is how we're going to do it. And in a fun way, and don't worry, I have to go to the bathroom. And so she solved the problem, but she really didn't want to. <laughs> <She's... laughs> that's funny. I think that's one of our biggest problems too, is like corporate America doesn't, they don't empower people to look at a situation and, and, and say, okay, this is what needs to be done. Or I think this is what needs to be done. Let me get my supervisor. No, it's all like our policy is. It's like, I can't help you. And she just wants to go back on her phone. I'm like, you are going to be the manager of Macy's. And she's like, I don't like this job. I don't want to be a manager. <laughs> but she solved my problem. But I did have to kind of pull it out. So it's like elevate people every day, whether they want to be elevated or not. <laughs> well, you did empower her to fix things. And she, she probably felt good about herself. She just wasn't going to tell you. <laughs> she she wanted to just go back on her phone personally. <laughs> yeah, those I, I worked at a clothing store for, I don't know, not too long. Um, I had a lot of small family-owned business jobs when I was in high school. And college. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I learned how, you know, being an entrepreneur is not easy, but I can't work in corporate America, so that doesn't give me too many choices. I do like yeah. to have a nice roof over my head. So how can we, let's see, let's start with, um, so if you're me 20-ish years ago, leaning toward the negative, oh, geez, bad. I'm like, oh, I've, I've tried this. It's not where, uh, you know, you're kind of, you're overthinking. How can we use humor and improv to get ourselves past that kind of thinking so it benefits our health? And then we'll go on to how we can use it for taking care of people with Alzheimer's. Yes. Okay. To get past that in that state, I actually spoke to some college students out here in Southern California at um, Chapman and also at Cal State Fullerton. And a lot of them are having a hard time. And they said to me, how do I get past, you know, like even when I'm studying and my mom's always coming in. And I said, you got to learn to use this yes and. You could put yes and on the door. I will be available in 45 minutes because you're telling that person, don't bother me for 45 minutes. And you, if you learn to do that, your mom won't keep bugging in. Put yes and, I will be available in 45 minutes. So now she knows. But again, it's a muscle. So how to get past our negativity is see the humor in every day. See the good in people. Also be open to new situations. There was a young kid that came up to me recently at our church and said, you know, I just graduated from college and my parents want me to get the job. And I pulled him aside and I said, I'm going to tell you something you never heard. He goes, oh, like where I should work? I said, no, go, <laughs> go have adventures. I said, sometimes when you're giving back, um, I, my son in San Jose, he worked with disabled adults for a while and he wasn't getting paid much, but he got to live in Baltimore. He got to live in Kansas. And then he went to China. 
And I said, go have adventures. Sometimes you're not making a lot of money, but you're learning. You know, I thought he was going to go into teaching because some of these jobs were teaching. Then he realized, no, that's not what I want to do, but I want to work with disabled adults. So that's what he's doing now on a corporate level. But it's kind of like you learn from your adventures. I mean, I probably would have gone right into acting and performing. But growing up in Pennsylvania, I said, I'll just be a nurse. And, you know, and it really helped me in a lot of ways. And uh, when you're on TV and movie sets, the more you could do. I do the medic stuff. I do the acting. So I'm combining everything, probably a mishmash. But <laughs> but that's but it, be open and go have adventures. And now leading into the Alzheimer's, it's hard when you're a caregiver because sometimes you have to say the whole thing over and over and over. And I know that. And the other thing is repeat it just the way every time. Don't change it with Alzheimer's people. You know, it's sort of like, this is what you said. We're going to have dinner at five. And even though mom will ask you, what time is dinner? When I was back with my mom once or twice, I actually sang it. I told you dinner was at five. It still is at five. You wanted to scream. She goes, oh, you did say that. Said, what time is dinner? It is still at five, my dear. So it's kind of <laughs> like you want to pull your hair out, but make it funny. And then maybe they will hear it. Sometimes we do have to repeat it, but don't change it all different ways because that will confuse the normal person. And it'll definitely confuse somebody with Alzheimer's. Say the same sentence, sometimes four or five times. And if you have to sing it, so be it. <laughs> <laughs> if that was the hardest thing for me. It was like after, like I would, my mom was, she wanted to sit around and sh shoot the breeze, right? Uh. Thought I was her best friend. You know, you're going to sit around, chit chat with your best friend. That was fun. I could have handled that, except she asked me the same question literally every two minutes. Yeah. And so I would go visit her on Mondays. Um, I didn't do photography on Mondays. So she'd oh. say, well, so what have you been up to lately? Well, it's Monday and I went to spin class and, you know, with, with, um, I don't think I ever said the instructor's name because at that time the instructor and I had the same name, which I knew would be confusing. That's it's confusing to anybody. Yeah. Um, it's. Yeah, and Jennifer's pretty popular name, so or it used to be. Just went to spin class, yeah. Yeah, so I'm like, oh, I went to the gym and did spin. Oh, okay. I'm not even sure she knew what spin was, but that's yeah. fine. And then she's like, so what have you been up to lately? Oh, it's Monday, so I went to Rotary. Oh, yeah. okay. And then I go, what have you been up to lately? Oh, it's Monday, so I went to Rotary, and Nancy Ann talked about improv for your health. <laughs> oh, okay. And then the last one was always, it's Monday, so I came to visit you, and then I'd usually put them all together. And now I've been there for 20 minutes and I'm out of topics. And if you would ask her or you'd say, well, it's Monday. So I, I decided to come visit you. Oh, that's nice. What have you been doing? Oh, the same old, same old. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains. I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about NeuroReserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Well, I have I have a trick for that, too. OK, because, good. I wish I'd known it five years ago. Because I have I have two sons. And when they were young, especially boys, they come home from school. What's new? Nothing. And I would say, make it up. And they would look at me. And guess what? They would tell me what they did. So it's sort of like, and I told this to a friend recently. Yeah, they always say nothing. So I say, make it up. Oh, well, I did this in gym. I did this. I did that. See, so when you say, make it up, there is something for them to tell you. <laughs> and that was my saying for the boys. <laughs> I wonder how my mom would have responded to that. Because she always had this stress, fear of 
doing things wrong, saying things wrong. She's yeah. very kind of well, okay, up. Let, okay, let's play. So I'm you. So hi, mom. It's Monday. What did you do today? Oh, you know, the same old, same old. Well, tell me. if Tell me what you did. I don't think I can remember. Well, make it make something up that you think you did. That might have been fun. That would be hard. What would she have said to that? <laughs> now, <yeah. laughs> Let's dig up your mom here. Yeah, yeah for real. <laughs> <laughs> so I, if she, if she could, what would, the, what would she have said? Because her short term memory was completely gone. Yeah, she probably would have gone into the way past. That's she probably would have talked about something about the kids because obviously she was a mother. She was a grandmother. Uh, I took care of the kids today. I did three loads of wash. Right. <laughs> and, and why, why'd you have to do three loads, not two loads? Well, you know, there was a lot of dirty clothes. <laughs> See, now I wish I'd known to ask that because at least even trying. Right. You know, and if she had said like, well, I, I, I don't want to get it wrong. I'm like, you can't get it wrong. You're going to make it up. Just tell me some goofy story. That's right. You can't get it wrong. You're going to make it up. So then I want to tell you one more thing about the brain, about multitasking. It ages our brain so much. Now, our society tells us it's good to multitask. It's not. I have three articles I could email you if you want, improv for health at Gmail. And why it says it's that it shortens the telomeres and it's equal to, you know, when the alarm goes off and you push snooze, 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 snooze. Well, that's what multitasking does. You start a job, you don't finish it. So again, when I was talking to those college students, they said, I'm studying and my mom keeps interrupting. So use yes and. So I have a lady friend and she said, I work at Target and I'm told I have to multitask because I'm constantly being interrupted. Then I come home. And I start folding the wash. I don't finish it. I pay two bills. I don't finish it. And I said, use yes, and. So you're folding the wash. Somebody's calling you. Yes, and, honey, husband, kid, whatever. I'll be down in a half hour. So you're acknowledging you heard them. Finish the bills. Finish the wash. But yes, and really does help. But it's a muscle. So I told this friend who was working at Target, I said, turn around when you're leaving Target and do the fun elephant way. Bye bye multitask and leave it there. Try not to take it into your daily life. You have to multitask at Target because they said we're going to keep interrupting you. And it's like she's constantly doing this and she's being interrupted. But try to leave it there. And our society, I don't talk on the phone when I drive, I get to places ridiculously early. <laughs> and that's when I'll call my friends. They'll go, well, why didn't you answer the phone when you were driving? Because you have to pay attention the way everybody drives now. And I'm an hour yeah. early. Now I'll call you. I, you know, I try not to multitask. I know sometimes we have to, but it's like, try not to do that. You are stop starting your brain and this is going to shorten your telomeres. And then you, you know, you'll be alive at 105, but you won't know you're 105. You'll think yeah. you're... <laughs> Like, you'll think you're 45. <laughs> you'll think you're 45, but your body doesn't look so good for 45. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I've see, I've worked from home since 2005. And I I don't get a ton. Well, I get way less interruptions now because my cell good. phone is on, you know, basically silence unknown callers. Mm -hmm. So I don't get any of that nonsense. Um now the Apple Watch does thump. When I get a push notification, sometimes I'll look at my phone to see, is that something I'm going to want to look at later? If not, I, I clear that away. So that's Good a distraction. But sometimes it's like, no, I'm in the middle of this. I'm not going to pay attention to whatever push notification just came in. So it kind of depends on what I'm doing. But Good for you, Jennifer. Yeah. And the other thing, you mentioned phones. People don't know you could put your phone to sleep. I put my phone to sleep at nine. It doesn't mean I'm in asleep at nine and it wakes up at six or seven. So people go, well, what about like if your kids call? You could star those people. There's mm -hmm. a way to star that if my son in San Jose or Texas or my mom, my mom was still starred until recently, but I guess I should, she's not going to call me from heaven, but I have like <laughs> a few people that are starred and they will come through. A lot of people don't know that about how the phones work. Ask young kids out there and they'll help you. But it's like your phone will still ring. And the other thing, I was traveling recently, and I said to my friend, it's asleep. And she goes, well, what about the alarm? The alarm will still go off at that certain time. Make your phone work for you. 
I have three friends that I call my high maintenance friends. Whatever they call, there's a disaster. So I gave them all the same ring. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's one of them. Do I want to pick up or not? <laughs> so it's like, make your phone work for you. I have a different ring for a cousin, for a friend. Yeah. I'm going to have to approach some young person because my phone hates my husband. I do not get a notification if huh. he texts me. Wow. No, it's very it's, annoying. Do you have him start. on your do yeah, you have him a, on your emergency contact? It should be. I'll double check when we're done here. Right now That's it's on a, do yeah. not disturb. He should be starved. I, yeah, he should be yeah, starved. Yeah, he is a favorite. Yeah. And favorite. I thought about maybe I'll try this when we're done. Backing up the phone to the computer and then resetting it and then huh. fixing going back to everything I have now. And see if that fixes it. But that's a real pain in the rump. So no, that, I think just check to make sure he's starred as, you know, one of your favorites because it should go through because that's what I have a few. Yeah, yeah, no, there's him and my daughter right at the top of the text messages. So it should be him. So I don't know. I was mad at him one night. So I blocked him. Maybe. And I unblocked him. So, yeah, he was being annoying. So Maybe he's still talk. blocked and you don't know. <laughs> they come through, but it's like you don't get. It, like it doesn't buzz my watch it doesn't make the computer you know my phone's on silent all the time but like the computer doesn't make its little noise it's i think you gotta strange. ask a young person about that because there are a lot of people that you know make your phone work for you my phone goes on silent when i'm driving and then people get a notification i am driving i will call you back you know so it's like we have these devices don't become a slave to them let them become you know we should be in control of them <laughs> yeah we don't definitely don't need to be slaves to to little you know no. <laughs> iPhones and Androids and stuff. It's not necessarily no. the best for us. A lot of distractions, a lot of bad news can come through. Right. Just like block them as much as that as you can. I've watched because my husband's a realtor. Uh, and sometimes when he's driving and he has to take a call, it's like, can I please get out of the car? It just, oh, it's like you would not think that talking while you're driving would be such a problem, but yeah. you're paying attention to what somebody's telling you. So, yeah, no, I'm not a huge multitasker uh, mostly because I'm super organized so it's uh -huh. like I can I can generally get everything done I don't need to try to juggle and I don't, get, I don't do well if I try to do two things at once neither one of them are good so well it doesn't yeah no it doesn't well good for you then you're doing all the right things and you even told me you on a peloton so your brain's gonna stay super young <laughs> I hope so well I started working out in 2009 to uh, lose weight so I didn't get the diabetes that was on my dad's side of family. And then in the intervening years, I've learned that that was also really good for my brain. Yes, it is. I'm not sure if you knew. So my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. Her mom had vascular dementia. My maternal great-grandmother also had dementia. So this is not a good family history. Mm -hmm. So apparently avoiding diabetes is also helping me avoid dementia. So that's, that's good. Right. And I, I do a lot of walking too. So that really helps too. Yeah, um, definitely. I so how to... do we find the unique, different things? Like I work from home and today it was like, well, I could go to the grocery store and grab that one ingredient we need for dinner until the other grocery delivery shows up. I uh -huh. said, but when I leave the house that I'm going to want to go to the senior center and drop off the supplies for the class that I'm going to start teaching in April. And then I'm going to want to drop off the tile sample. Like there's going to be all these errands and I don't have time for all that. So I'll go tomorrow. <laughs> go tomorrow. And also it was raining today where you are. So you don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. It's still, I think it's still pouring, but it's like, so my days are not that different because I'm home all the time. Mm -hmm. And right now I don't want to go outside because it's nasty. <laughs> no. But when I go out and do errands, I'm like, I always do go to four or five places. I did that even before the gas went up. That was something my mom taught me. <laughs> You know, it's like make a phone call, see if they have that product that you want. You know, you know, I I try not to do errands willy nilly. I like do at least five or six right in a row. <laughs> well, where I live, so it's about about five or six miles down the highway, mm. just to get to a old and tired Target. Oh wow! And you know, so it's like so one day, so I I I have a club in my community where I we get together we make handmade cards that's the hobby that I I chose during the pandemic oh, it's nice. nice does not take a lot of artistic ability does not <laughs> clutter up your house because you know have canvases and all this like, you just got little pieces of paper and if you don't like it you could throw it away or toss it in the fireplace whatever okay you know, <laughs> pretty you know for the most part it's really easy to un undislike 
which is not and very. And people get homemade cards from you. That's special. Yeah. Yeah. My neighbors loved it because I had uh-huh. so many. I'm like, uh-huh. I need about 500 friends because I just sit down and start creating. And the next thing I know, it's like, well, now I have 60 birthday cards and like five friends. Okay. <laughs> so, You're stocked so, up for a while. Yeah. So the neighbors got an entire year's worth of cards. So every holiday, sympathy. Wow. Um, I didn't do Christmas because that's more personal for people. So they can do their own Christmas stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, I needed some more card stock for the group. So I got in my car. I drove to the Michaels. It's the closest one here. Yeah. Um, it's not as nice as the one that's 45 minutes away. So I drove to Michaels, got the card stock, did not shop around, drove home. I was gone for an hour. I'm like, I can't do this. So how do we, if we're, I don't want to say stuck at home, but if our life is based at home, like, you know, during COVID, or for those of us that are working from home or taking care of somebody and are at home all the time, how do we shake up our days? So, you know, Monday is different from Tuesday, blah, 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 without just doing a different Peloton class and eating a different breakfast. (laughs) Okay. So when you do your errands, I would not get in my car for one place. I mean, I know you had to go down the mountain and all that. So make up a list. Like since I'm going down the mountain and I'm doing this and I'm doing that, that day you could go to the grocery store and get, you know, your different items. You could go to Target. You could go to Michael's. Uh, You know, I wouldn't. And if it's a rainy day and you could change it, you want it to go on a Tuesday, go on a Wednesday because hopefully it won't be rainy, you know. I mean, I only go out if I'm doing at least three or four things. <laughs> it's I did that before. And now with the price of gas and our time yeah. is valuable and being self-employed, our time is valuable. We have to spend time getting back to people and computer and this and that. So treat, you know, as you, you've been treating your life like a job and that's what it is. So don't take like one errand and then that's going to suck up a big part of your day. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but, you know, if you really needed it bad, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah, that was that was kind of eye opening. I'm like, dang, that dang. was because I, I I didn't have a lot of time. So I was yeah. like, so that's why I didn't browse around Michael's because it's like now I got to get back and do whatever it was I needed to do. So it's like, ugh. But, but speaking about it now, you'll you won't do that again. I know. <laughs> no, I try not to, but it's like it's it's hard because the good shopping is literally a 45 minute drive. That's and true. then yeah, yeah. It's so you know it's like. Yeah. I don't live in the boondocks. Like you sound like you I don't live in the boondocks. I just drive to Ralph's or Target or it's pretty close. But I still well, we got a new a brand new Target coming. So today is March 28th. I think uh-huh. it's supposed to open April 12th. Oh, so good. the one that's closest to me, I think these are about the same distance apart. The new one's probably a little further. Um, the one that's closest to me is old and tired and small, and it's not it's like if you don't get that target E40. Yeah, well. <laughs> I haven't been there in forever. So the new one the will, new be, one will be great. <laughs> yeah. And my husband will probably go all the time because he goes up to Grass Valley for his barber and his gym. And like he does almost all the errands up there because he's already up there for the gym and the barber. So I'll stop at the grocery store. Well, now I'll stop at Target. And that's how he does things. But if we're not doing errands, we're take we're home taking care of a loved one. Or like me, you're home with the DOG who is sleeping on the couch as usual. (laughs) You know, how do we not get into a rut of, you know, every day looks like the day before. And the next thing you know, it's been three months and you don't even remember what you did because all the days are the same. How do we? I think, yeah, have special things that you look forward to. If it's not every day. I, I'm in a couple of women's groups. GSFP stands for Global Society for Female Entrepreneurs. And we have a lot of meetings. So on a meeting day, I'll try and leave like two hours early, even though I don't need that. And then I'll do my errands before. I look forward to my meeting days. I look forward to you know seeing friends. If I'm going out to lunch, I make sure I'm doing three or four things that day. Because there are days when I actually do like to stay home. My neighbors think I never stay home. But it's like kind of arrange your schedule you know, and look forward to one or two things, whether it's DC. um, Yeah, I just went to Italy. I'm going to Atlanta, um, but oh, Arizona and Atlanta. But (laughs) I have a question about your finding memories. How did you pick that? I love that. Oh, fading memories. Okay. So you were on Days of Our Lives. I've never been a soap opera watcher, but we had an incident in the memory care with my mom. So the first 18 months she was there out of the three years, she had her dog which was great in the beginning. Yes. But as she progressed in the disease 
and the dog progressed in her weight gain. So she was mm. a miniature poodle. Should have weighed about 15 pounds. She weighed 28, mm. which prevented her from proper doggy hygiene, which was nasty. <laughs> That's Ooh. enough said there. And there was a uh, the med techs. So the um, executive director called me and he said, you know, we have a little bit of an issue. We're trying to figure out how to solve it. So the residents in the memory care, many of the older ladies, were storing half their food to give to the dog. Oh no, that poor dog. <laughs> oh yeah, the dog. Oh, and and the prior to moving to memory care, all the dog had to do was bat her brown eyes at my mom, and my mom would give her a treat. When maybe oh. you know a little snuggle or a little petting would have sufficed. It would have definitely been better for her weight. Oh. So we had come to the conclusion that um, during meals, the dog would be in my mom's room. The med techs would feed the dog morning and evening. I bought a new bowl. I bought a proper size scoop so that they didn't even have to think about, you know, fill the scoop up, plop it in the dish. I had low calorie dog food being delivered to the memory care, you know, the community. The dog did not care about our plans. (laughs) I don't know if you've ever heard a dog howl and scream, but this dog howled and screamed. And so the, you know, the residents would be like, oh no, the poor dog. And, you know, you can't argue and, and get crossways with somebody with memory issues and an older adult, because, you know, you're teetering on, on the very fine line of elder abuse. So there was a gal that lived with my mom um, in the community and she was a complete klepto. If she laid her eyes on it, it was hers. Do not let go of your purse. Because she, I literally had to fight for my purse one day. And I'm like, oh, no. she's smaller than me, but strong. But and I was like, how do I off. get my purse away from this woman? So I'm trying to stuff the dog, unwilling dog, into my mom's room. So I can escort my mom to the dining room, get her seated for meal, and then go home. Wow. The dog is having a hissy fit. Madam Klepto had locked eyes on the dog. And was not happy with me because I was taking the dog away from her. She grabs my mom's forearm and said something to my mom. And all I heard, because my back was to them, as I literally tried to shove a 30 pound poodle into my mom's room hmm. if you touch me one more time, I'm going to knock your block off. And I thought, oh my God. Oh so my I immediately God. abandoned the dog project, <laughs> shoved my mom out the door that she was standing next to into the courtyard. She was so angry, she was shaking. And here's where dementia was my friend. I just kept saying, oh, it's so terrible that, and I can't remember what this gal's name was. It's so terrible that Jennifer has, has, you know, her mind is so bad that, you know, she thinks Misty's her dog. And it's just so sad that her mind is so bad. I just kept repeating it over and over. Mm-hmm. And after about three or four minutes, my mom looked in the window and went, I think they're having dinner. I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> and, it just went. and so, and I, cause I was afraid that she literally smacked this woman. You did the right thing saying, that's what I was telling you earlier about say the same sentence, you know? So I posted this story on my Facebook page and a past photography client of mine said, you should write a book. And I said, I am considering it after mom's gone. um, And I think I'm going to call it as the memory fades, which for anybody who's listened, watch soap operas, that's kind of a little play on, you know, um, what is it? As the wheel turns. What is that soap opera? There was um, as the world. As that's the, it. As the world yeah. turns. So as the memory fades. Well, yeah, podcast well. art is so small that that's way too many words. Yes, so I had to is. short shorten as the memory fades to fading. Fading memories. Oh, I could almost see from days of our lives, the time, the sand, like the sands of. Yeah, I met McDonald yeah. Perry a couple of times before he passed away and he would. He's, I think it's still his voice that talks about that. Oh, yeah. wow. That's kind of cool. So, yeah, yeah, that's how we came up with that. Oh, and, that. you know, when I started the podcast, there was only one other one. And now there have been some that have popped on, you know, during, co- not, yeah, during COVID. Mm-hmm. And then I'm assuming that their person has passed. So they've stopped making the podcast. I have nothing else to do. <laughs> Well, Good for make, you for keeping make, it up. It's so important. It's so important. I, I get to talk to so many really interesting people and like yourself, Uh-oh. and I'm still learning. Like, you know, you've given me tips that I wish I'd known when my mom was still here. So that makes me confident that if I'm learning new things, the listeners are learning new things. And I'm just amazed that we can keep talking on the same topic, caregiving, 
And, and it changes, you know, yeah. what, what <laughs> one person does this week, we find out, let's try something else. And it's so important. Yeah. And you with the dog, I just have to, I was bragging <laughs> about my son in San Jose. I have a another son he's in texas and he's a veterinarian so <laughs> so i have a son in texas who's a veterinarian he does emergency vet and i was afraid of dogs growing up but we did get a little dachshund and we nourished him for 15 and a half years he passed away it's okay and he would howl so when you talk about howling dogs cosmo would howl and he was a little dachshund you know but boy he knew his mind the same way <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we've had six Goldens. Unfortunately, three have passed from cancer. Number oh. five is still with us. The sixth one passed away February 27th of this year. Mm. Um, he was only, he wasn't even quite six. So that oh. was kind of hard. But, you know, That's, it's kind of the risk yeah. you take with Goldens. But it just amazes me. Like, we've had three of each gender. And they, the girls are always sassy. But it's amazing they're sassy in their own way. <laughs> and, like, yeah. the boys were all kind of different. but really loving but loving in there it's like it just blows my Osmo mind it was more loving to me and then you know if the guys would come over it was like he would protect me but he was a little boy dachshund purebred that lasted 15 and a half years so the smaller dogs so dogs bigger dogs don't have bigger hearts comparatively to a smaller dog yes that's why bigger dogs don't live as long i just saw a video they don't live a, as long and they get cancer more that's what else my son said too they do oh, well i'm I grew up with I grew up with poodles. I would kill to have a standard poodle, Ooh, but sorry. it standard poodles have basically hair. Lots of hair. And I don't want to pay more for the poodle's hair appointment every six weeks that I pay for mine. I mean, <laughs> you know, fifty That's bucks. Why we, every got, we got a dachshund. Get a dachshund. They <laughs> last forever. And we got the short hair. So if you find hair around, it just looks like little eyebrows. <laughs> so, I mean, we hardly had any hair around. That's why. Yeah, my husband love I. I would get a golden doodle, but it looks like a mutt. The <laughs> tail doesn't look right. Like they don't dock poodle tails like they used to, which is probably a good thing. But I, I have a, an a poodle aesthetic, you know, burned into my brain. Yeah. And so I have yet to see a doodle that doesn't look like a mutt, which mutts are cute. Not going to lie. But, you know, yeah, I'm a little but... biased. So I don't know. We're sticking to one. Luna is a. Uh, she does not care what we're doing as long as we all do it together. She loves to take adventures. She loves to go Good. on the paddleboard. She loves to go for walks. She'd probably go bike riding with me if that was a thing we could do. I am not taking a 70-pound dog on my bike. No, you cannot it's think about Too many hills. Um, she so loves what happened going to your the... mom's dog since we were talking about the dog? And how did it all end? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Leave everybody hanging. I want to know. So after 18 months of living in the community, um, they renovated the entire community, the assisted living, the memory care. They um, started on the assisted living, which was two stories. Mm. And one day, the executive director, we had a very great relationship. He was on the show at least once. And I think, no, he was on the show twice. Okay. And pretty sure it was twice. Anyway, um, he you know, he makes it a point to find me um, when I'm visiting mom. So like, you know, he had like an alert on his phone. She's usually here on Monday afternoons from two to whatever. So he went and in. He, and yeah, he comes in and he goes, well, like, you you know, we're, we're renovating, right? And I'm thinking, yes, you put all the dumpsters in the 10 parking spots for the memory care. I think I'm aware, but I, I avoided the snarky <laughs> response. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, I know. It's so, kind of excited to see how it's going to come up. And he goes, well, we're going to be getting new carpet in the memory care. I'm like, okay. So what you're asking me is to rehome the dog. Well, no, I'm not really saying that. And I'm like, okay, but that's what you'd like me to do. That man beat around the bush so hard. I had a very hard time not laughing at him oh, because, cool. you know, he obviously had to deal with the whatever 300 residents and the residents' families and all the staff. I'm sure that man did not get paid nearly enough money. Yeah. despite the exorbitant bill we paid. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if you, so you had a purebred um, dachshund. Yes. Did, you got it from a breeder. Yes, we did. Our neighbors. And um, that, it happened by default because I was always afraid of dogs. And I said, I wonder if all the dogs are claimed. And my son said, I can't believe you asked that. And then I saw him when he was born, he was the size of your hand. I'm like, how yeah. could I be afraid of that? So yeah. We got well, I don't know one. if you if you guys had a contract, but generally contracts with breeders 
they the dog is co-owned between you and the breeder. Oh no, they didn't do that. They just okay. Up. It's pretty common because they put a lot of work into keeping the, you know, like the the boy dog that loved me tremendously that he would sleep under my chair and get kicked in the head recent all the time. He was supposed to be a show dog. They let us have him. They kept his brother. Brother. They actually cryo freezed his sperm. That oh is how God. much of a champion the brother was, and they look yeah. like twins. So. Wow. You know, you, the, yeah, this, ours, this, ours was a purebred. He was a purebred dachshund. Yeah. So that's when we learned because, like, my husband, being former banker and a real estate agent, you know, he likes to read contracts and owners' yeah. manuals. But I don't do any of that crap. <laughs> um, sometimes I have to force myself to at least skim contracts so I don't, or I give it to him. Like, here you read. I can it, relate. Like, I don't years. like. To. Yeah, it's like I don't understand this gobbledygook. And like, just make sure I'm not getting myself in anything in yeah. trouble. That's so true. he was like, I never knew this, but we. Like the breeder we got the two of our six dogs from, like she still owns the dog. Like wow. we co own it. And he was actually a little offended. I'm like, well, there's a reason for it. It's a little weird, you know, but they put a lot of work into their DNA line, basically. Yeah, it's hard. Right. It's hard work. Yeah, yeah. they don't they don't want you to just go breed it with some, you know, random dog on the street. So sure. I called the breeder and I explained what was going on. And I, you know, I said, So you co own it, so I need you to take the dog back. Oh, and um, it took a little arm twisting and I finally had to get a little crossways and basic and I would not have done this. I'd already called Poodle Rescue, but I told her if you don't, con- you know, confirm that you're taking this dog back by X date, because on Y date, the carpet's going in and this dog yeah. pees all over the place. Um, I'm taking her to the pound. So, oh, boy, that's sad. Yeah. And yeah, no, I wasn't going to take her to the pound because, you know, she was yeah. older and way overweight. So the breeder took her back and sent her to Oregon with her grandkids on a ranch. Oh, I'm assuming Misty got down to a decent weight and probably lived her golden years um, pretty happy. In Oregon on a ranch. Oh, that's interesting. Um, Um, You know, she was pretty house pet spoiled. Wow. Um, So I don't know how she, I mean, I don't know if she was, I I would assume she was not an outside dog because with a poodle, that's just asking for a constant mess of, matted dirty hair that's right yeah and but mm. we my sister and i were at the point we were like i would bring mom my mom mom and i would go visit we would go to the park and watch kids that's what we did um it made her happy and it was the least amount of stress for me so it worked and we would come back and the dog would literally i don't know how this double her weight dog literally leaped up and down but she would leap up and down yeah. on my mom's legs and my mom would be like yeah, yeah. I shouldn't I get all grumpy and I was like okay the dog is more of an appendage than a you know emotional support critter and my sister and I were kind of like yeah at what point do we like take the dog away because she's you know she could go out in the garden run around and come back in the building and pee on the rug right yeah <laughs> so you but know you we were acting on the carpeting and the place and and the dog was gone Mm-hmm. And yeah. my husband went and picked her up. Said, "Oh, I'm taking Misty to the groomer." Misty never came back. My mom never asked about her. Okay. I was like, okay. That, that's- so, you know, I think it worked out fine for everybody. We got to save a hundred bucks a month on the extra cleaning. I was <laughs> cleaning. Me. Where did the dog go? Yeah, <laughs> yeah she was beamed up by alien. <laughs> yeah, our dog got old and sick and went through a lot of medical bills. But luckily, our son was still in college at home doing his biology. So he knew a lot. And I would just say, it's your job. You, you figure it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you deal with the dog. Yeah. We yeah. ended up at UC Davis's uh, veterinary school with our younger one. And that's when we found out he had cancer that Jeez. penetrated the liver and his lymph nodes. And that's sad. they were like, yeah, they're like, well, we could give him chemo, but he'd never leave the hospital. It's like, what's the point? No, <laughs> no, that's sad. So we, yeah. We spent three weeks basically letting him do whatever he wanted. That's he got to play did. in the snow. And he wasn't, he didn't eat. That was the only sign uh-huh. something was wrong with him is he was racing and running and playing, but he wasn't eating, which obviously yeah. is not a great sign. So one day my husband gave him a bite of leftover meatloaf. He gobbled that down. Like it was, I don't know, uh-huh. whatever, doggy Nirvana. So my husband literally made him an entire meatloaf. That's fine. And did he live on that for a while? Yeah. And then, then it was like, well, I was sick of this. So then, it, then we moved on to another food. 
Yeah, yeah. And then he got then he got that really fancy raw food that's like fifteen bucks a oh, pound. Oh, we got some of that. Yeah, you had to go special store and buy that. We did that for a while, and yeah. When we knew Cosmo was at the end, Chris went to Kentucky Fried Chicken. I said, you can't feed him that. He goes, well, we're going to put him down this today or tomorrow. And even that, he picked at the chicken. Then he picked at the mashed potatoes. And he picked at the cookies. So anytime I see Kentucky Fried Chicken, he got him a kid's meal. I was like, oh, that was his last meal. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's not like it was going to kill him. So. No, no. Yeah. That's nope. Crazy. That's just our crazy life. Well, we so, covered everything from brain to dogs to people. Yeah, we were travel. We were we were everywhere, Jennifer. It's like <laughs> if you guys didn't get something out of this, well, I'm sorry. It was a fun conversation. Regarding. I think they'll get a lot out of this. And remember, yes, and will open doors, but no but shuts the doors. <laughs> so when you want to say no but, just go around the back corner and go, yes, and I heard you. <laughs> well, I like yes, and because you know we've got a women's service organization which. If anybody's involved in those, know that they have a tendency to be older adults. Yes. And so they kind of tend to, you know, not that I'm super young, but, you know, I got 47 years to go. So we're yeah. still good. <laughs> Middle-aged. Yeah. And, you know, so they're like, I I wanted to donate um, note cards to them that they could raffle off or, you know, they had a person that was doing that. So I'm like, hey, I've got like an excess here. Do you nice. want them? They're like, do you want to join? I'm like, mm, no. Mm-hmm. And, you know, how do you tell them no politely? And so I like the, now I'm interested, know. however, I'm a little overcommitted. So the a yes and would have been very, it would have been a lot easier than the avoid. I was doing improv with a woman in Northern California and she was leading a women's group. And she goes, how do I prevent everybody from going down the negative rabbit hole? My hip hurts, my this hurts. And so we did a few sessions and then I would give her these tools. And I said, how did it go with your lady friends? And she goes, well, it started off okay. Then they went down the rabbit hole and I had to bring them up. And then I gave her more tools. And every week we would do a one-on-one. And so it kind of worked. Yeah. So I like doing big groups, little groups, small groups, (laughs) all kinds of things. So. How can people find out about you and these groups that you you little, that you host? <laughs> like that, they could email me at improvforhealth at gmail. I have a little website. It should be updated. It will be eventually. Um, people hire me to speak for large groups, corporations, or one on one. I could do a Zoom with people. Um, I just love sharing the tools of improvisation and enjoy your moments, people, because that's really all we got. I said it yeah. before COVID and people are like, oh, now I get it. I have t-shirts that say, enjoy your moments, you know? So that's what it's all about. Just have fun. Don't, don't think, don't overthink things. Yeah. Yeah. And don't worry about tomorrow. Cause that's, uh, no, don't don't bar- what is, what, what's the phrase? Don't borrow tomorrow's troubles or something along those lines. Enjoy today. Yeah, this is nice. It's yeah, you never know. Tomorrow's not guaranteed anyway, so. It's not. And if it rains, you'll be inside anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm beginning to think I'm going to have to like, I don't know, put on a raincoat and go stay outside. Yeah, we're tired of this rain in California. I know your podcast goes out to other people, but California is not used to this much rain. I mean, this nope. Is- no. When I was in D.C., people were like, man, you guys are like going through it. I'm like, uh-huh. uh-huh. I know. I'd, they'd be like, where are you headed back to? Soggy California. And they're like, oh, uh-huh. man. You know, it's like, yeah. I have a past guest that's in Vermont. She claims we've had more snow than Vermont, which makes my brain hurt. Oh, I think we <laughs> have. That's why I we'll be we have... skiing in, in June or July, like we talked about. Yeah. Maybe I'll take skiing back up. I got kind of cruddy knees, but. I could probably handle some bunny slopes and Do the bunny slopes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It might be right now. I really want to go to the snow, but then I, you know, I go on social media and I see the people who had to like dig the uh, trench from the front door to the, I to know. the car. And it's like 12 feet deep. I'm like, no, thank you. <laughs> I guess if you go to Tahoe and get hunker down in a nice little cabin for a couple of days, that sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. The problem is, is that like earlier today, I was very concerned that the power would go out before we got to, to this chat yes. because the lights were flickering. Because I mean, it was like, are we going to have a tornado too on top of the rain today? <laughs> yeah, it, this has been very clear, at least on my end. Nothing's been going out, so that's good. Yeah, no, we've been we've been good. I, I haven't seen any flickering, and then I haven't heard the wind. So okay, you know, it's just that's the thing. It's like you just sometimes you gotta. You got to go with the flow. I'm like, well, go if I have to flow. use my phone, I can use my phone, but I don't know if I can use the green screen and we'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll just figure like, it out. Well, thank you so much for having me and finding me. You found me through Anthony. Is that what you said? Yeah, Sue, Sage Stream. Yes. So 
Um, I'll actually YouTube. keep up with their link in there too, in case people want to check it out there. Um, how would you describe Sage Dreams? So it's artists and musicians that do performances Sage online. Sage Dreams brings people into senior centers. And I've been telling a lot of people, like, you know, when they have the big screens, go and watch TV, but see Anthony's show. So I'm on there and I did comedy. Um, it was kind of interesting because you didn't get the feedback. And he said, can you go a half hour? I said, sure, I'll tell some medical jokes. And then, you know, he would have singers playing guitar and whatever. But and it's a great idea what Anthony is coming up with. Yes. So we just need to get it out there and tell more people. Yes. Yeah, I've been like in the back of my head, quote, I need to find an improv person to have this conversation with. And one day I get an email from Anthony and I'm like, improv and nursing? Wait a minute, must contact. <laughs> <laughs> like, I didn't even have to look. It came right into my head. <laughs> and Anthony's from the East Coast and so am I. So we hit it off. Yeah. So talking about Alice Ray, my mom who passed away, she's 89. She has a dear friend that is now 91 and they moved her from the East Coast to California and she came out this year and she goes, you oh, people man. are crazy. You say the weather's nice. It's not. It's windy. It's cold. I said, I know you just picked the wrong year to move out, but she's doing really good. She's at a senior living where she comes and goes by herself and, you know, she's enjoying her moments. Her grandkids are there. Her kids are there. And this week I'm doing improv and comedy at that place. <laughs> so That'll be fun. We'll just tell her, wait a few months. It'll be hot. That's and then ne <laughs> next winter, we'll probably have zero rains. <laughs> That's what we're hoping. I know. I know. But well, thank I you. appreciate this. And your the email is in the show notes. So you can contact Nancy Ann if you want to and learn more. You can go to Sage Stream and watch her. And I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation. It was a little random and, and <laughs> rambling, but that's okay. We can use those sometimes. We got everything in. Thank you very much. Have fun. Thank you. Bye. Enjoy your moments. <laughs> Bye. I will. Bye-bye. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.